Well, this evening we're going to pick up right where we left off last Wednesday evening, and I'm going to do my best to finish the section that we're in. That way, Pastor can pick up in a new section next Wednesday evening. And this Sunday, Pastors Gene and Sue will be back with us. Pastor will be doing 9 a.m., I'll be doing 11 a.m., and we're going to continue the new series, Four Things We Must Confess. And this Sunday is really important. And I would say it's all important, but uh, this Sunday is really important, so don't miss. Now, we left off last Wednesday evening dealing with how in your prayer life and in your confession, determine and purpose in your heart to stand with God and to stand with His Word. No matter what's going on in the culture, no matter what people are saying about the Bible or changing this belief and that belief, purpose in your heart to stand with God and to stand with His Word. And if you'll do that, He will stand with you. And He will watch over His Word to perform it and to bring it to pass in your life. And we left off saying that in 2021, the easiest thing to believe is the Word of God. You, you ought not feel bad about believing the Bible in 2021. There's a lot of wickedness out there. It's ever-increasing wickedness. There's a lot of crazy out there. And so the easiest thing to believe in 2021 is the Word of God. I saw just today that it's, it's really wicked that they're fighting in court and they're trying to use the courts to force doctors to perform gender transition surgeries against their moral conscience and against their personal religious beliefs. That's wicked. That's wicked to force a doctor to do something that they believe is morally wrong. And it is morally wrong because it's a great evil. Amen? Amen. And whatever the world wants to call it, that's, that's mutilation. That's wicked. That's a great evil. That's the kind of stuff that the, the Nazis did. And so the easiest thing to believe in 2021 is the Word of God. And as I said last Wednesday evening, don't, don't let anybody make you feel bad for believing what the Bible says and standing with what the Bible says. No matter what the challenge is or the difficulty, no matter what you're believing the Lord for, refuse to allow your lips to destroy the effectiveness of God's Word in your life. Refuse to allow your lips to nullify what you're believing God for with a negative confession or being negative when you pray or when you pray positively to then maybe an hour later, a day later to, to nullify your positive praying in the, based on the Word of God with your negative mouth. And it's, again, when we deal with things like confession, it's our steps are being ordered to the Lord to walk in His best. Amen? Amen. And uh, the Bible says the little foxes spoil the vine. Periodically, we all have to remind ourselves of the basics. And as I've been encouraging you, you've got to police your own life. Uh, we're not the faith police running around policing others. We're not the confession police. Police your own life. And if you're married, you can help each other. Amen? Amen. But do that in love. Well, so we stand with God, and we stand with His Word, and He will make His Word come to pass. So you've got to hold fast to your confession of faith. Tell your neighbors, say, hold fast. Hold fast. You've got to hold fast to what you're believing you receive. Tell your other neighbors, say, hold fast. Hold fast. And so when we stand on His Word, and as we've encouraged you to do on Sunday mornings, the Holy Week Revival, when you find two or three scriptures that you're standing on, you're standing on the Word. You're not standing on sense evidence or the flesh. You're not standing on the faith of others. And praise God for the faith of others. But we want you to learn how to believe God for yourself. Amen? Amen. You're standing on the Word of God. And your confidence is in God and His Word. Your confidence is not in others or in the prayer of others. You know, when, when someone's trying to get as many people as possible to pray for their, their situation, that, that's an indication that they have absolutely no walk with the Lord. They have no confidence in their own relationship with the Lord. They have no confidence in their, their own prayer life. If it's just someone by themselves in their home, in their closet, if they know how to go to God on the basis of his word, he hears and he answers without anybody else being involved. And so there is the prayer of agreement, 
but we have to watch ourselves and when we do those things that we're not operating in doubt and unbelief. So our confidence is in the Lord and in his word and we hold fast to that. So you gotta hold fast even though maybe your eyes cannot yet see the answer. He's heard you, he's answered. The answer's on the way. It's coming into manifestation whether that's physically or financially. I know there are young people believing for a godly spouse. Just got to hold fast and not give up and not throw in the towel and uh, not compromise and not marry the beast and think that if you kiss him enough, he's going to turn into Prince Charming. That, that's a movie, but that ain't real life. And I know, I've seen God do amazing things. The Holy Spirit can really get a hold of someone, but they have to be cooperative. And they have to be yielded. They, they, they have to be open to the Lord doing a miracle like that in their life. You got to hold fast no matter what the circumstances look like. And you got to hold fast no matter how you feel. And that's a discipline, amen? Because there are some days that we feel strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then there might be a day and you feel a little blue or you feel a little discouraged or you feel a little frustrated about this or that. So you got to hold fast no matter how you feel. And it is your quiet assurance in the word of God that gives you the victory. It is your quiet assurance in his word that gives the victory. Now we know from the word of God that all authority has been given to us in the name of Jesus. And we know from the word that every disease, every sickness, every demon, every circumstance must submit to the name of Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians 2 beginning in verse 9. And Paul writes, therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, say every knee, every knee. so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So that's not leaving anyone or anything out. And verse 11, and every tongue, say every tongue, every tongue. confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So every knee and every tongue. Say every knee, every knee. say every tongue. Every tongue. That, that's every, everyone, everything, including Satan, including every demon, including every work of Satan, including every negative circumstance, and so everything must submit to the name of Jesus. And there's coming a day when every knee will bow. There's coming a day. Now, better to bow the knee now. Better to believe now. Better to give your life to the Lord now. Better to submit now versus to be on the wrong side and be at the white throne judgment and think, well, I should have believed. I had all those opportunities, and I should have believed. So his name has all authority in heaven and on earth. Paul says even under the earth. God's word tells us that we have the legal right to use the name of Jesus. We have been authorized to use his name and that's true in any and every circumstance. Say, I have a legal right, have a legal right. To, use Jesus. to use the name of Jesus. Now we're not gonna go to John's gospel tonight, but Jesus taught us in John's gospel that in that day, which is the day we're living in, because he's with the Father, he's not here with us in person, although we have his spirit, we have the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said in John's gospel, in that day, we would pray to the Father in his name. And so we have been authorized to use his name and to go to the Father in his name. Say, I have a legal right, have a legal right. to use the name of Jesus. And, and this is why, you know, at public events, they want to find some minister, and that's probably not even the appropriate term anymore, so, some person, <laughs> to pray some generic prayer that no one knows who's being prayed to, what's being prayed about, and no one knows whose name in which it's being prayed. You know, at the, when there was still the rodeo a few years ago in the old Coliseum, we took the kids and they had a student from Bright Divinity, which is TCU Seminary, pray the prayer. And you know, it was one of those dear Mother Earth nature prayers. <laughs> it was horrifying. But this is why, you know, they don't want you to come to city council and pray in the name of Jesus. 
And that's why there's this big push. You know, I've, I've mentioned that, I think, in the last two years in Christianity Today, which back when that started, that was uh, put together by Billy Graham and other like-minded evangelicals to have a Christian news publication. But now it's just a liberal magazine. That's even beyond that. But they've been advocating that Christians shouldn't even pray over their food anymore. You know, that's a long way from Smith Wigglesworth standing up in a restaurant and saying, I'm going to pray for everybody because I assume you haven't prayed and your sinner's going to hell. <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to do that. But don't feel bad about being at lunch or dinner and, uh, you know, praying in the name of Jesus and blessing the mill. Amen? Amen. And, you know, now that God bless young people. Amen. You know, they don't train them that, you know, when someone's praying, you're not supposed to interrupt. You know, I've been waiting 10 minutes anyway. They, you can, they can, now they can wait while you finish praying. So don't, don't, you know, if they walk over, you're praying, just ignore them, amen, and finish your prayer and make it a good one. So you have a legal right to use the name of Jesus. And we ought to use the name of Jesus because the devil doesn't like that name. And the forces of darkness don't like that name. And circumstances that have been created and inspired by the devil and his forces, they don't like that name. And that name has authority. That name has power. That name gets results, amen? And so whether it's over your food, or it's in the car with the children, or it's in the, once we can all start visiting loved ones and people we know and friends in the hospital, whether it's in the hospital room, you ought to pray in the name of Jesus. Because it's that name that has power and authority. You're his son or his daughter. You are a child of God. So for whatever the need is, whether great or small, stand before Father God in the name of Jesus. And our Heavenly Father, he is under obligation to see that he confirms what we pray in the name of Jesus. To see that his word comes to pass and to see that we are not put to shame. Jeremiah 1 and verse 12 in the Amplified Bible says, the Lord said, you have seen well, for I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. Other translations say to perform it, to bring it to pass. So Father God will make his word good. He will bring his word to pass. You see that in Mark 16. It says at the very end of Mark 16, and the Lord worked with them, confirming the word. Father God is bound to his word. And he will make his word good. He will not fail us, and his word will not fail us. So you got to hold fast. Tell your neighbor, say, hold fast. Hold fast. Tell your other neighbor, say, hold fast. hold fast. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw on the towel. Don't cower in fear or worry or unbelief. No matter what you see, no matter what you hear, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what it looks like, you know, it's been a while since we told this story, but there was a period of time where Jessica's father faced a, a great challenge in his physical body. That's why if there's a problem, you got to find out what, what's going on so you know how to pray, you know what to do. Amen. Don't let it get to a really bad point. But it was a miracle of God that he's alive. He's here with us, but he was in ICU, I believe, for more than 30 days. That was a fight of faith. And you can get yourself all ramped up spiritually and go in the room and pray. And, but then day two's coming. And day three is coming. And day four is coming. And day five is coming. And day six is coming. And I think Carolyn spent most of those days and nights there in the room because she didn't trust them on everything going on. And that's, that's a whole different conversation. So it, you've got to look not and say what the Word says. You got to look not and stay positive and hold fast. And then surround yourself with people of like mind and like faith that will encourage you. So tell your neighbors, say, hold fast. hold fast. So don't be moved by what you see. You're not standing on sense evidence. We don't walk by what we see or by what we feel. We walk by faith. We walk by the Word of God. During the Holy Week revival, Pastor said that the confession of our faith it creates our reality. That over time, our, our circumstances line up with what we say. Over time, our circumstances line up with the word and our confession creates our reality. You know, it's amazing how 
here at FCC and St. Paul's, we, we literally do have a, a faith bubble. It is literally a faith bubble. It is a normal bubble. You know, this past week, someone asked me if, you know, we were doing stuff in person, and I, I tried not to burst out laughing. You know, but you don't even want to say, because it's like, are you, you one of those tattletale people? <laughs> but what we have, because of our confession, and what we've said, and what we believed, and what we've done, the action we've taken, we, we've created our own reality. And so the world has its own reality, but you can have your own reality. You, despite what is going on in the world and what the, what's going on in the world in your average home, your average family, you can create your own reality in your home. You can have a home that's filled with love. You can have a home that's filled with peace. You can have a home that's filled with respect Amen. and respectful teenagers. Amen. Amen. You can create your own reality. And so in each of our lives, we're each walking in the light of our knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. And you can't believe God at a level beyond your understanding of the Word. And that's why, praise God for Sundays and Wednesdays and special weeks, but you've got to get in the Word for yourself. You've got to renew your mind to the Word so you can have greater understanding, greater revelation, and walk at a higher level, and pray at a higher level, and confess at a higher level. Because we're each walking in the light of our understanding of the Word. And our faith will never go beyond that understanding. And our confession won't go beyond that understanding. And our faith will never grow beyond our confession of the Word. So it's incumbent upon us to get into the Word, to develop greater understanding, greater revelation, so we walk in greater blessing. And I mentioned that, I think, Sunday or last Wednesday night, that we, we understand things now that we did not understand 10 years ago. And we, we, because of that, we are walking in greater blessing now than we ever have before. Doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Doesn't matter what the world is doing. We're blessed. Every need is met. Every bill is paid. And there is more than enough. It, does, it doesn't matter what lumber costs. Doesn't matter what gas costs. Doesn't matter what milk and eggs cost. It doesn't matter. Because our Father God is Jehovah Jireh. He's the Lord God, our provider. And He can increase us and increase us and increase us so it has no effect upon us. See, that, that's different than, you know, well, I believe Philippians 4.19, but I, you know, I'm worried, I'm concerned, I, I'm fearful. You know, we're eating peanut butter and jelly for the rest of the month. And so you will walk in the level of your understanding of the word. And so if you want to walk in greater blessing and greater power and greater authority, you got to get into the word and develop your understanding. In our lives, the word becomes real as we confess the word and we say what it says. And it's, this is the reason why we walk by the word and not by sight. We walk by the word, we walk by faith and not by what we see or what we hear or what we feel, sense knowledge only confesses what it sees, or hears, or feels. And the people who seek experiences, they're always walking by their senses, and they're not walking by the Word of God. They're always talking about what they've seen, or what they've heard, or what they've felt, but they're never, they never talk about the Word of God. They'll always talk about their experiences, but they'll never say, the Bible says. And the result is that over time, their lives simply don't bear the good fruit of the Word. There's nothing that is more wonderful than the presence of God. But day by day, we're to walk by His Word. Day by day, we're to walk by faith. A few years ago, Sunday morning, prayed with people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that when you ask, you receive. Now, there could be a hindrance with you, but our Father hears us when we ask. And so part of it is being yielded and surrendered. But a man later shared with me that he was prayed with that day, but later during the week, he was just on his way to work, minding his own business, and he had an encounter with the Lord in his car. And he had to pull the car over because 
He, he was so moved and overwhelmed by the presence of God. That, that's wonderful, amen? But there are going to be days in the car that aren't like that. There are going to be days in the car where, you know, I, I can relate, family of five, everybody get in and get buckled now. Amen. And you're doing your best to walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh, and to walk in love. Get buckled now. <laughs> There, there are going to be days in traffic, you're irritated, you're praying, but uh, it doesn't feel very spiritual. So praise God for the moving of the Holy Spirit and praise God for his presence and praise God for all of that. But day by day, we have to walk by the word of God and we can't walk by what we see or what we hear or what we feel. During the first great awakening, there were times when the power of God was so strong upon George Whitfield that they would have to carry him back to where he was staying. John Wesley was a conservative Anglican. His father was an Anglican minister. And as he saw God move, and he was a traditionalist. He didn't want to preach outside. The only reason he preached outside is the Anglicans stopped letting him preach inside in their churches. And so as God moved, he, he was a traditionalist. He, he was a little concerned about what he saw going on, but it was the moving of the Lord. And so it's not either or, it's both and. And it's wonderful when God moves, but day by day, you have to walk by the word of God. Day by day, you have to walk by the word and not by how you feel. Satan does not fear us seeking after experiences because he operates in the sense realm. And that's the realm in which he so easily deceives. He, the Bible says he masquerades as an angel of light. What Satan fears is us standing on the word of God. What Satan fears is us confessing and saying what the word says. What Satan fears is us being doers of the word of God day after day after day. An untold story is that Jonathan Edwards had preached sinners in the hands of an angry God many times, the time that it had great effect, he just happened to be visiting a church and women in the church had been praying for the Lord to move. And so the Lord moved, but it wasn't because of Jonathan Edwards or that sermon in particular. But to us, it's famous, one of the most famous in American history. But it was because there were women in that particular church and they were praying. But he was a pastor. And after the Great Awakening, as a pastor, he observed that during the years of the Great Awakening, the people that seemed to have the most fleshly, physical experiences or manifestations were later the very same people that were backslidden, not genuinely living the Christian life, and weren't doers of the Word of God. And so praise God for the, the moving of the Lord, amen? amen? But in your daily life, you gotta be a doer of the Word, and you gotta stand on the Word and, and pray the Word, no matter how you feel. Praise God for his presence. But regardless of whether you feel his presence or not, his word is true. And he's watching over his word to perform it and to bring it to pass. Amen. Amen. So you got to remind yourself of that. Satan fears our standing on the word. Satan fears our confession and our saying of the word of God day after day. Romans 10 beginning in verse 8 says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. We're saying that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the mouth that you believe and are justified. And it is with the mouth that you confess and are saved. So what do we proclaim? The word of faith. Say, I am to proclaim. I am to, I am to, speak. I am to speak. I am to declare, am to declare. The, word of faith. the word of faith. And notice verse 10 says, it's with your mouth. Say, my mouth. My mouth. So say, it is with my mouth. My mouth. So again, this is the big challenge for most of us. And James, dealing with it in the negative, he calls it a world of evil. But you can turn that around and speak life to your life and circumstances. Doubt-filled words, whether in your daily conversation or in your prayer, your praying, Doubt-filled words will negatively affect your heart. Doubt-filled words will fill your heart with fear and worry and anxiety and unbelief. Faith-filled words will positively affect your heart. 
When you speak or pray doubt or fear or worry, it will destroy your faith. But when you thank and praise God for the answer in advance, that will build up your faith. And that's what takes faith, being in the hospital room when it doesn't look like anything's changed and lifting up your hands and thanking God for the answer, thanking him for the victory, thanking him for the healing. Thank, when, you're, when you're not going home yet, thanking him that you are going home. That's faith. And that's what causes circumstances to change. You build up your faith when you speak of our Heavenly Father's divine ability, which is at work in you. Say, it's at work in me. It's at work in me. And that's, you know, I've been reflecting a lot on great men of God we had the privilege of being around. And I've been thinking a lot about Dr. T.L. Osborne. And he was always working on me to get me to understand that when we're not trying to get something, we have it. Because we have him. And he lives in us. And he wants to work in us and through us. And he was always working on me as a young man that we're not trying to get God to do this or that. We just have to release what is already on the inside of us. And so his divine power and his divine ability is in you. So you got to release it. And one way we do that is with our praying and our saying. Words of faith will build up faith in your heart. Words of faith will cause your faith to grow. But when you speak of trials or difficulties or worries or a lack of faith or a lack of money or how your body feels, your faith will shrivel and it will weaken. You know, it's the same way when you see somebody talking down to someone, whether it's a husband or wife, or even worse, you see someone talking down to a child and you can see the child cower and their, their posture and their demeanor change while they're being talked down to. Well, see, when you, you talk down with your mouth, your spirit hears every word, and you're doing that to you. You're doing that to the real you on the inside, and it, it's causing weakness in your heart and in your spirit. Negative words will cause your spirit to shrink back in doubt and unbelief. So this is why we all have to renew our minds and remind ourselves of who we are in Christ and where we are in Christ and what we possess in Christ and what we can do in Christ and then pray accordingly every single day and confess accordingly every single day. And of course, on Sunday mornings and the series, the first thing we must confess is the first part of that series has to do with who we are in Christ. And we all have to be periodically reminded of that because we let go of things. And so it's good to have a refresher, amen? So you gotta remind yourself of who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ and what you possess in Christ and what you can do in Christ and then pray accordingly, confess accordingly, take action accordingly. You gotta take action on his word no matter what you see, no matter what you feel, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what your eyes tell you, you gotta hold fast to your praying and your confession of faith despite every impossibility. Faith doesn't ask for what's possible. Faith asks God to do the impossible. If we can do it, why do we need to pray about it? If we can do it, why do we need to ask the Lord to move? If we can do it in our own strength, why, why pray about it in the first place? Faith doesn't ask for what's possible. Faith demands, faith expects the impossible. So we don't pray and ask the Lord for what's possible. We pray and ask him for what is impossible, for that which we cannot do in our own strength and our own ability. We pray and ask for the supernatural. We pray and ask for the miraculous, because it is him at work with us and in us and through us and on our behalf. Amen. Romans 8.32 says, but he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Say all things. All things. And, and that's why the, the, the theology that would have people believe, well, healing's for some, but it's not for all. The blessing of the Lord is for some, but it's not for all. That, that is a great, great evil because it robs God's people of faith. 
It robs God's people of believing God for more and believing him to do the miraculous and the supernatural in their lives. How will he not also along with them graciously give us all things? Say all things. All things. I've quoted the reference many times this year from 1 Corinthians where Paul says, all things are yours in Christ Jesus. Say, say all things. All things. So when we pray, we're, we're dealing with the miraculous. We're dealing with the supernatural. When we pray, we are in the realm of the impossible. Just as Abraham asked God to do the impossible when Abraham desired a son as an old man. When we pray, we don't ask for something that we can do in our own strength, our own, own ability. We ask for the impossible. We ask for something beyond reason. Something beyond reason. And I said a few Sunday mornings ago, you know, I was not there when the Red Sea parted. I was not there when Moses spoke and water came from the rock. I was not there when he struck the rock in anger, which he shouldn't have done. I was not there when they woke up in the morning and there was manna. I was not there when they irritated the Lord and he sent quail as far as the eye could see. But we, even though we haven't seen something like that, we, we have seen astounding, astounding miracles in the past year and a half. It is truly, truly, truly astounding. So no, I was not there when the Red Sea parted, but I feel like I was. Because the things that we have seen God do in the past year and a half are totally and utterly amazing. And yet, people have their faith in all kinds of things except God and except his word. I'm, I'm horrified, and I try not to think about it, but I'm horrified how people have faith in the government or how people have faith in a politician or how people have faith in this pharmaceutical company or that pharmaceutical company or even though your chances of getting it or your chances of dying are so low they, they have great faith in this shot or that shot see if people had that much faith in God and his word they would live like they were in the book of Acts and they would pray prayers that would move heaven on their behalf so we're living in interesting days we're living in the days of Malachi 3.18. We're living in the days of Matthew 24. I believe it's verse 12, but it's somewhere in there, Matthew 24. Well, we're living in the days when Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? We're, we're living in those days. It is truly amazing. So when we pray, we're, we're dealing with faith, and we're asking God to do the impossible. We are asking for things that are impossible and beyond reason and what we can do in our own strength. So ask and believe you receive and refuse to fear or worry, refuse to give doubt or anxiety any place in your life. And this is where the battles fought on a daily basis. This is where some of the greatest battles are fought in your, your thinking and in your thought life. The greatest battles are where we face the most opposition and where at every turn we seem to face fear and doubt and unbelief and worry. Some of the greatest battles we fight in our prayer lives, in our confession life, is with the mind and with our thought life. So what must we do? Look over at 2 Corinthians 10 beginning in verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10 beginning in verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. And that, that's the power that is at work in you and through you. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension. And something that is pretentious has no right, has no place, has no authority. Unless you allow it. So we demolish arguments, and how, how many pretensions? Every one of them that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive, how many of our thoughts? Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, Austin, I'm looking for something less rigorous. I'm looking for something with less 
commitment. Well, your brother, sister, you're looking for something with less blessing. And you need to read Matthew 5 through 7 and uh, reacquaint yourself with the standards of the uh, Christian life because they're not the standards that the world says they are. We are to take captive how many of our thoughts? Every thought and make it obedient unto Christ. So that, that's a daily thing. You got to do it every day. And so when you pray full of faith and you rehearse the word, but then you're in the car and thoughts of doubt and fear and worry and anxiety come or you're at work or there's this report or that report, you've got to hold fast to your praying and your confessing and then you've got to take captive every thought and make it obedient unto Christ. So you, you can live a godly life even in your thought life, but it's going to take a concerted effort. You got to take captive every thought and make it obedient unto Christ. So you got to hold fast to your praying and your confession, and God will make his word come to pass in your life. And you might think, maybe if you're new, you might say, well, Austin, your parents, or you and Jessica, y'all seem to have crazy faith, but this is only because in our lives we have proved his word true again and again and again. And whether the answer came in three days or seven days or six months or a year or a year and a half or five years, the answer always comes. And that's why, as Pastor encourages us periodically, you need to have a list of your faith goals. You need to have a list of what you're praying and believing God for. You need to have a list of the answers to prayer, the testimonies, and the miracles, because one benefit of that is over time, as you're faithful and consistent, you'll see with your own eyes all that God is doing on our behalf. And it is truly, it is truly, it is truly astounding. You know, in my confession booklet, which I bring on Friday mornings to prayer, and I have in there prayer requests we've received, but I also have in there some things that my father has given me over the years. There's one sheet of paper that a few years ago I thought was nuts, but most everything on that sheet of paper has happened or has come to pass. So again, when we pray and we confess, we are in the realm of the impossible, but that's what God does. But you got to stay with it and be faithful and consistent. And some things happen quickly. Some things take time. But it all happens over time. Because as soon as we pray, he hears an answer. So you have the answer. You have the victory. What we're waiting on as we fight the fight of faith is the physical or the tangible manifestation. So in your life, you have to prove the word out in your own life. And God will meet you at whatever level you can believe in that. That's why you got to renew your mind to the Word and lift up your eyes and develop greater understanding and greater revelation because He'll meet you at whatever level you can believe Him at. So you got to confess your dominion over sickness and disease in the name of Jesus. Don't be frightened by any condition or by any diagnosis. Don't be frightened by any report or by any evil report. And this is why we always say if it's something serious, you need to get a second report or a third report, Amen. or you need to go visit somebody who knows what they're talking about to double check. And it, it doesn't mean that someone's lying or they're dishonest, but some people have greater skills. Some people have greater knowledge. And if there is a fight of faith, you better be sure, because you certainly don't want to confess something that's not true just because somebody was wrong or they made a mistake. But don't be frightened by any condition or diagnosis or evil report. It might be cancer or COVID, or a situation in your physical body in which death seems to be the master, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. Know that you and God are in charge of the situation, and never in one moment give up on your confession of your dominion over every work of the enemy. Whatever it is, whatever the circumstance, the disease or the calamity is not of God. It's of the devil. And you got to settle that in your heart. That stealing or killing or destroying, that's Satan. It's not God. And if the source is Satan, he's defeated and we have the victory. And so in our praying and in our confession, we're enforcing that victory until we have the physical manifestation. Until you go home, until you run the victory lap, whatever it is. Say, Satan, Satan. Has, no right, has no right, no place, no place. and no authority. In my, life. in my life. 
say Satan, Satan has, no right, has no right, no place, no place and no authority, no authority in my physical body. My physical body. Say Satan, Satan has, no right, has no right, no place, no, place, no authority no in my finances. In my Say Satan, Satan has, no right, has no right, no place, no, place, no, authority, no authority in my family, in my, family, in my, home, in my home, in my children's lives, in, children's lives. in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. That, that's the truth Amen. from the Word of God. But you got to enforce it. And you got to run him out yes. with your praying and your confessing. And you just have to have the attitude, you're not going to tolerate stuff anymore. Amen. And you're going to tell him to get the hell out. Amen. And you're going to make sure he leaves your house, and he leaves the neighborhood, and he leaves the vicinity. Amen. And that's why it's an old story, but the story pastor tells from the early years of the church in the 80s, where there was a family, they, were, they had a teenager problem, bad attitude, rebellion, all of this. Once, when Jessica and I were interviewing builders for the home we're in now, we met the builder in a nice neighborhood in Fort Worth, and showed us this home, and this mom was all apologetic. Well, she had one of these uh, demon-possessed uh, 20-year-olds, and uh, we couldn't see certain rooms because he had been kicking holes in the walls. Well, see, that, that's not the Lord. And uh, that, that's the devil. So you got to decide you're not going to put up with the devil, and you're going to run the devil out. But you can't have the devil on your TV, you can't have the devil on the computer. Amen. You can't have the devil on the iPhone. Amen. You can't have the devil in iTunes. Amen. And so pastor sometimes will tell the story how in the 80s, there was a family in the church and they had a teenager problem, rebellion, bad attitude, hell on wills, all of that. And so they wanted pastor to come pray and to pray, you know, pray in their room. You know, prayer works no matter where you pray, amen? That's one of those things of greater understanding and greater revelation over the year. I can, I can, over the years, I can pray about it at 5 a.m. prayer, amen? But anyway, they wanted the pastor to come and pray in the house, in the room. That's one of those things you do when you're young, amen, is you're, uh, you're learning, amen? But he, he went in the room and he instantly saw why they had a, a, a demon in the home. Because with what was on the walls and the posters and the, the, the home was a, the, the, the room was a, uh, a monument to Satan. And one of the posters on the walls was Kiss, which now seems probably tame compared to uh, other things in 2021. But that meant nights in Satan's service. I remember once as a young man, Aaron, I don't know if it was the youth group or just a few of us, Aaron took some of us to a Christian concert, and, uh, but there was a young man there at this Christian concert, and he had a Metallica shirt on. And on this Metallica t-shirt, it had a, a demon, a devil, but the tagline said, I'm inside of you. So, you know, we can make all kinds of excuses. We can say, oh, that's just a, you know, they, they like scary movies or they like that kind of music, or they, they like this or that, or it, it's not that bad. But you, you will manifest whatever you fill your heart with, whether it's that kind of stuff or uh, this trashy and moral stuff that's so popular now. That, that's not music. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop. Don't want to get into a fence this evening. Amen. Praise the Lord. But you got to run the devil out. But part of walking in the blessing of the Lord is not giving him any place. Amen. One of the nights at the Holy Week Revival, it was the Wednesday or Thursday night, pastor got into a whole list of things. And he finished and he texted me and the next day he said, you know, I just had no intention of doing or saying any of that. And he said he was praying about it that morning, but the Lord told him that's where they're defeated. So you got to decide. You're going to get all of that junk out and walk at the level of blessing Amen. that God has for you. Amen. Amen. Because this is so critical when we pray that when we go to our Father in the name of Jesus, our hearts do not condemn us. And if something you're listening to or watching or people you're talking to or things you're saying, the way you're speaking, if it's leading to your heart condemning you, that will sabotage your prayer life. Amen. Amen. Let's end with Colossians 2 and verse 15 where Paul reminds us of what Jesus has already done on our behalf. Paul wrote, 
Colossians 2.15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them. So not only are they, they defeated, but they are mocked and they are made fun of and they are a laughing stock publicly. Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Say, the devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. Say, the devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. And my life, my life. And, my home, and my home, and my family, and my, family. And my, circumstances. my circumstances, say, the devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. And I am going to run him out. Amen. Amen. And that's whether it's bad attitudes, sickness, disease, something small, something big. And a secret of faith is learning how this works on the small things so the big things are no big deal at all. Amen. Don't wait for the big things. To exercise your dominion and authority and your faith. Take action every day with the small things, and chances are you'll never face the big thing. Amen.